Welcome to Cut the Bull, an insightful podcast which addresses the news of the day and the cultural issues plaguing our society. Bringing logic and context to these topics and discussing solutions too real for mainstream pundits. Now, here are your hosts, Charles Love, Shamika Michelle, and Wilfred Riley. We'll be joining us shortly, but we are pleased this week to be joined by Jason Riley, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a com- columnist with the Wall Street Journal. Jason, welcome for jo- thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So there's a lot of things we can talk to you about. Obviously, we need to start, though, with Thomas Sowell. I want to know, I mean, you, you've done a lot of work. I mean, you got the documentary and the new book, Mad, Maverick, and I want to talk to you about what brought that to your plate. What made it so important to you to uh, chronicle his life? Well, the, um, the, the, the documentary came uh, from the book when the uh, producers of the, of the documentary film um, found out I was working on a biography of Thomas Sowell, they approached me and asked me if I was interested in, in uh, narrating the documentary and doing some of the interviews. So that's how that came came to pass. Um, and it was released earlier this year uh, for public television, actually. And uh, first was available on, on local public television channels, and now it's available uh, for, for streaming on, on YouTube and, and Amazon and, and, and so forth. So uh, we've been very happy with the, with the response, but that's where the the idea for the documentary, um, uh, or that's how I got involved with the documentary. Um, the, the, the book has been um, sort of a, a longer term project. I, I uh, first uh, discovered Thomas Sowell in college uh, back in the, in the early 90s. And uh, I worked on the school paper and was sitting around chatting with some of uh, my fellow editors on the paper about affirmative action. And one of them said, Jason, you sound like Thomas Sowell. And I said, Thomas who? And uh, the person wrote down uh, the, the name of a book on a sheet of paper, and I went to the library that evening and checked it out and read it in one sitting. And I uh, went back the next day to my school library and checked out the rest of its uh, Thomas Sowell collection. And so I've been, I've been hooked, hooked ever since. And um, uh, I first got to meet Sowell in the mid-'90s when I was working at the Wall Street Journal on the editorial board. And he would come through New York, where I was based, on book tours. Uh, he was already at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, but every time he had a book out, he'd come through New York and meet with the editorial boards, and uh, so that's when I first got a chance to meet him. And then I later went out to Hoover to do a long interview with him for the paper, and we sort of struck up an acquaintance that has uh, uh, endured uh, over the years. And I was quite shocked that someone else hadn't already written a a biography about Seoul, and. Um, uh, so I started asking him if I could, I could do it, and um, he can be a stubborn man. <laughs> so uh, it took a little persuading, but you know he's 91 years old now, so maybe I just wore him down in his old age. But uh, he finally, he finally agreed to it. I, he, he kept saying you can do it without my cooperation, and I, and I could have, but I thought it'd be a better book if he did sit for some uh, long form interviews uh, with me, which he finally agreed to do. And so um, uh, that's how that's how the book came about. And you got to do quite a few long form interviews oh, yeah. with him, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I interviewed him a number of times. I had over the years. I mean, we, you know, whenever I was out in California, particularly Northern California, I'd look him up. We'd go to lunch and dinner. He'd do the same when he was in in, uh, in New York visiting. Uh, so we, we we stayed in touch over the years, and I'd interviewed him a number of times uh, and, and talked to him about a number of issues. But in addition to that, he sat for several very long interviews for the book specifically. So he was very generous generous with this time. And basically, I, you know, I, I think that Thomas Sowell is one of the great thinkers um, uh, of the 20th century. And um, um, uh, uh, I, I was sort of annoyed that, that names like uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and, and Nicole Hannah-Jones and, and Cornell West are much better known mm-hmm. than Thomas Sowell. Um, Ibram Kendi, uh, I guess, would be the latest. Right. You know, I, I think Sowell has written circles around those individuals, maybe around all of them put together, frankly. And it's not just um, the range of topics he's covered throughout his long career, but it is the rigor and the depth of his thinking that I don't think they come close to matching. 
And um, I, I thought that this book and this uh, documentary film uh, might introduce Saul to a new generation of people uh, because I think, um, I don't think he's gotten the attention he, he deserves. Well, well, let's start there. Um, obviously, lots of people talk about these topics in different ways. And like you said, we'll get to why more people don't know him in a bit. But what's unique about him? Let's talk about some of the things that he was able to do, uh, you know, when he was teaching and when he was at the Institute and writing his articles that other intellectuals weren't able to do. Well, I, I think what distinguishes Sowell is his uh, honesty, frankly. And, and it, uh, in some sense, that shouldn't distinguish you as a scholar. <laughs> Um, that's what we should expect of our intellectuals. Um, but unfortunately, today, that does distinguish you. Soul is someone who has put truth above popularity consistently throughout his career. He's someone who follows the facts where they lead. He's very empirical in his thinking and in his approach to various topics. And he's reported the results, even when those results were politically incorrect. And, um, and he's paid a price for that in terms of uh, prestige, uh, in terms of prominence, um, but he feels that that is the, the, the job of an intellectual. And I really think that's how um, he's distinguished himself uh, throughout his career, particularly when it comes to writing about various, various racial controversies. But I would add that, and I get into this in the book, which is really an intellectual biography of Sowell, something that focuses on his scholarship and his legacy. Um, is, you know, if, if, if Thomas Sowell had never written a word about affirmative action, he would still be someone worthy of biographical treatment. Um, uh, his first discipline is economics and the history of economics and the history of economic thought and ideas. Uh, so he's really a scholar um, uh, uh, that focused on people like Adam Smith and Thomas Malthus and David Ricardo, the whole classical liberal school and 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 uh, that was his first love and teaching was his first love he wanted to spend a life teaching economics uh in the academy preferably at a small school where you can get to know the students and uh the problem was that this was the 1960s and college campuses were changing you um uh, had a, a women's rights movement a gay rights movement a civil rights movement an anti-war movement and all of this was playing out in the 1960s on colleges across the country and administrations were grappling with their role how to handle this uh, these movements were using colleges as a platform to get out their views and um Sol was kind of an old school guy um no you cannot be excused from class to go to a uh, anti-war rally uh, no we're not going to spend all class talking about the latest headlines i'm here to teach economics you're here to learn economics and he had constant run-ins with students and administrators over his tough grading, over his no-nonsense approach. And it all reached ahead, I, I believe, in uh, the late 1960s when he was teaching at Cornell. And they had uh, these armed students taking over uh, buildings on campus. And Sol was really disgusted at the way the administrators just caved to all of their, their demands. And uh, I, think, I think at that point, he was really done with, done with teaching. He continued to teach throughout the 1970s uh, places like Amherst and Brandeis and UCLA, mm -hmm. uh, and eventually he retired in 1980 to join the Hoover Institution. But I think that experience in the late 60s at Cornell was really pivotal, uh, and he was really done with the academy by then. And through most of the 70s, even while he was still teaching, he sort of had one foot out the door, focusing more on book writing and, and, and um, uh, being more of a public intellectual. Uh, so so uh, I think, though, that he, you know, he made his mark uh, in the 60s, writing in his discipline, which was economic history, and he really did distinguish himself there, and uh, was acknowledged as such by his uh, by his peers. Uh, uh, he only turned to writing about these racial controversies really in the 1970s, and, and that's when he became a much more controversial figure. And he says he turned to these issues out of a sense of duty, mm -hmm. that there were things that needed to be said, and there were too few people willing to say them. Now, I think and, that that's the key. I, I think yeah. that's important because you know, a lot of these things, you talk about the honesty, and, and it really comes down to the, seeing a problem, knowing it's bad and wanting it's fixed, and listening to everyone else talk about it and saying, 
they're not addressing the real issue. They're, you know, it's window dressing, it's feelings, it's, it's those kind of things. So I think that is what's important, you know, for me. And what leads to the other thing that I think is really unique is that as an economist, that can be really dry and boring things. And, you know, I've had a lot of academics on my show and, and they do great work and they write these great books. But I always end up getting to the point that I challenge them. I say, what you do is great. But here's the problem. You see a problem and you wrote about it, but you write in a way that you're really writing for other intellectuals. So the, you're, you're a professor, the professor at the other school reads it, you all discuss it, you know, he tells you, well, you did a good, made a good point there, but here's where you're wrong, and it stays up here. Mm -hmm. But that's fine in economics, but when we're trying to solve societal and cultural problems, you know, those things are going to be moved by the populace, and they're not reading your books. Right. And Thomas right. Sowell had a way to, you know, explain these things in a way that regular people say, I get it, and uh, I understand it, and, and I see the importance in it, even those who don't agree with them. And so, Shamika, I want to know what you think about that. I know you have a soul book, and I know that um, you are really big on honesty and truth, and you have problems with the way the information is being disseminated today. So can you kind of relate with what Jason is saying about Tom Soul's approach to economics and when he started writing about uh, affirmative, affirmative action and race and culture? Yeah, well, first I would like to say um, when he spoke about uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, my daughter just had to go and get a book and my eyes rolled because I was just thinking like they're going to be taught certain things that I kind of don't agree with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was in my 40s before I heard of Thomas Sowell and that's what's sad to me. It was when I was in conservative circles that I heard um, good things or I heard things about him so I went out and got discrimination and disparities I think is the name and then I got charter schools and their enemies because all of my children went to charter schools and I'm very uh, you know pro school choice and I think it's just sad that we don't hear as much of him I never heard about him growing up and anybody that I hear a lot of times in black communities talk about him it's always with disdain and I don't understand why you know he's labeled kind of with the the coon label or just like Ben Carson when I read about being Dr. Ben Carson's story I was thinking how are these men not lifted up you know, as scholars and as people that we really need to learn about and learn from, even just reading the book, I, I didn't see, I, like I could not understand why I had never heard of him until my older age, why he's not being taught in school. And I went to an um, all-black school uh, from, you know, kindergarten through college, and I, I had never heard of him, and it was just really sad to me uh, what we, you know, learn as black people and who we shun, those that are really trying to teach us and help us and, and change us and get us from this, you know, group think that we have. It's really sad that those are the ones that shun. And I'm like, he's in his 90s. You know, we have him here now, opposed to waiting until he's gone and then people discovering him and then saying, oh, this was a great man. He's still here. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's just sad that more people don't know who he is. When you said in the documentary that media was, you know, when it said media was hiding him, I have to totally agree with that. Yeah, I, I think to use um, today's terms, uh, Soul was canceled. He was canceled right. a long, long time ago. Uh, back in the in the 1970s, when he started writing about these various racial controversies, he um, he parted ways with the thinking of the civil rights movement, uh, a movement he had supported uh, for most of the 60s. Uh, supported the Civil Rights Act of 64. Supported the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But what he saw happening um, within the civil rights movement is a change in their focus, uh, particularly post 1965. You had more of a focus on um, electing black officials, gaining more political clout, and thinking that that would be the secret to helping blacks rise economically, if we can just get more of our own in office. And so you saw the civil rights movement really laser focus on that. Um, the other thing that disturbed Seoul was um, they moved away from equal treatment toward special treatment. And uh, he, again, 
said this was the wrong the wrong way to go things like affirmative action and racial preferences and things like that so Sewell began parting ways with uh, with the civil rights movement there and he was very outspoken about it and um, a lot of black elites a lot of uh, other black intellectuals at the time made him pay a price for that they went to uh, mainstream media outlets and, and said Sol is not someone who should be turned to to speak on behalf of these issues or to speak on behalf of what other blacks are thinking and um, it's the sort of thing that continues to this day um, you know Sol has a I write about this in the book and I, I went through a lot of uh, old interviews he had done particularly on television and uh, he'd often be asked often by white interviewers they would say you know, how does it feel to go against the grain of, of, of your people, of, of black people? And uh, Sol would always correct him and say, you know, I don't go against the grain of most blacks. I go against the grain of most black elites. And black elites don't represent most black people any more than white elites represent most white people. Mm -hmm. So you were, you were mentioning school choice there. Most blacks support school choice. Most black elites oppose it. Um, most blacks support voter ID laws. Most black elites oppose it. Most blacks oppose racial preferences in college admissions. Most black elites support it. So these divisions, <laughs> it's not only on one issue, it's on a whole range of issues. Most black people support crime control in their neighborhoods. Most black elites want to, you know, divert resources away from police in some of our inner cities, defund the police and so forth. So there's always been this disconnect between the elites and everyday blacks. Um, but you nevertheless have these folks going on television, on radio, claiming to speak on behalf of, of the black masses, so to speak, when they're really, really speaking on behalf of themselves. You take an issue like critical race theory. Critical race theory started in academia, in legal circles, and the argument put forward at the time, in the 1970s, was that uh, a professor's uh, race and ethnicity and gender should be used as an academic credential in the hiring process. Critical race theory is a fancy argument for affirmative action. That's how it started in the academy. And these people were making that argument on behalf of themselves, not on behalf of blacks generally. Affirmative action, we long know, a lot of it from Seoul scholarship, that affirmative action programs primarily help blacks that are already better off to begin with. Yet they're sold in the name of helping the black poor and the black underclass. Um, but that hasn't happened. Um, so, so Sol pointed out these things many, many decades ago. He's been right about them for a long, long time. And we continue to see today some of the patterns he detected going all the way back to the 60s and 70s. Well, you mentioned CT, uh, CRT, and I want to mention, uh, piggyback on something Shamika said. Um, when she talked about why she didn't know about him, you talked about him being canceled years ago. But it's funny, you know, in this debate about education, we talk about, which, you, which is not true, let's be clear, it's not true that the people complaining about what's going on in their schools are racists who don't want to teach black history. That's just a fallacy. But even if that's true, people like me will, will say, well, then you say, what do you want to teach? You say you want to teach the honest history. You want to teach truth. But you're still cherry picking. Everybody's cherry picking, right? The day is only so long. You, you, you can only teach so many things. It's, you have to wonder why a guy who's been doing it for 60 years and who's written numerous books doesn't get the recognition as a guy who wrote one book, right? You know, that one book, you know, you talk about, I don't know how many books they have now, but really, you know, you talk about Kendi and, and Coates. They are known for, well, his book um, in, in Coates' case came from his long Atlantic article on reparations. But still, Between the World and Me, and how to be an anti-racist. That's, that's their whole legacy, in a sense. And then well, I think it's worse, it's worse than that. If you, if you're familiar with the 1619 Project, which is the brainchild of Nicole Hannah-Jones, who's written no books about anything. Who's never written a single And she's a tenured professor paper. now. Uh, has never written a single academic paper. Now, th now think about this. Uh, the 1619 Project is being adopted by K through 12 schools all over the country. Thousands of school districts are adopting this curriculum on the basis of this woman who is not an academic and has never written uh, a book. 
about slavery, about U.S. history, and about or about anything else. Anything. There are no shortage of books that have been written about slavery and U.S. history in this country. None of them by Nicole Hannah Jones. <laughs> now, 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 why? We're getting back to academics now. Why is it, you know, that more historians at prestigious universities are not shouting from the rooftops that this stuff is nonsense. Right. That this whole idea that America's founding was rooted in slavery or that America is uniquely evil right. for its slave past is just purely nonsense. Why isn't every scholar who actually knows about this topic denouncing her? Because they're afraid. Right. They're afraid. They're afraid they'll be called names. They're afraid of her Twitter mobs. They're afraid they'll be called mm -hmm. racist and sexist. Right. Tom Sowell was never afraid. Right, right. He did it anyway. Right. He did not fear such things. And it's what distinguished his scholarship. It's not just honesty, it's bravery. Mm -hmm. And it's why I titled the book Maverick. I think we need a hundred more just like him. But that's a good example of what we're missing today. When, right. we're, when, 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 the, when the Tom Sowells pass from the scene, you have a bunch of intellectual cowards out there that are going to let someone like a journalist rewrite U.S. history right. and teach it to our children because they are afraid of calling her out. Right. And, 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 and I, I think that's just shameful where we are today. It is. And, and you upped the ante on me, so now I want to up it a little bit more. You know, we're going to get back to Seoul, but we got to talk about this. So I have a book coming out in November called uh, Race Crazy. And a third of the book is about the 1619 Project. I actually write a chapter on every essay. But the, the obviously the most uh, clearly addressed focus is on her, her first essay and the whole project. But the, you, you, you mentioned that they're afraid to say anything about her for whatever reason, you know where the culture is going, even though she hasn't written a book, they're giving her so much praise. But it's beyond that, not only are they not saying it's wrong, and it is, but she's being elevated for it, which is bad, but it's also, you know, a, another layer to it. So she's writing and created a project, not writing because she doesn't have a book, but she created a project surrounded around the DNA of America being racist. The, the, it's wholly racist. This country is racist and it hates, it hates black people from beginning to end. Yet the only reason we know her name and the only reason she has money and the only reason she has prominence is because these so-called racists allow her to write about how bad they are. How can no one see that? So she, she's, we know her because she wrote how bad whites were. Yeah. And then some white person said, here, let me put you on a pedestal. <laughs> and so you can, we can celebrate you on how well you tear us down. It makes no sense. No, no, it doesn't. And, and, I, and I don't mean to paint with too broad a brush here. There have been a few historians who have pushed back. Some names come to mind like James McPherson and Sean Wilentz and Gordon Wood and a few others. But by and large, they've stayed silent. Uh, they, they've, they've just let this let this pass. And, but, but I don't know, Jason, because even the ones who push back, they push back on the technical thing. They say, well, technically, it's not this. Or technically, you know, the Revolutionary War wasn't fight for this, fought for this, which is true. But they don't they don't say anything about her saying the DNA of the country is racist and, is, and yeah. everything about not mentioning an abolitionist and going talking about Reconstruction and not mentioning Ulysses S. Grant at all because she didn't want to say anything positive. There's nothing positive about a single white person in yeah. that entire process. Project. Yeah, that's yeah, the, the, that's historically yeah. inaccurate. Oh yeah, M much much of it is historically inaccurate. I've I've read some critiques about the claims about um, the the Revolutionary War being fought to preserve slavery taken down. I've also read some critiques of the argument that uh, the slave economy br bought you know brought America mm -hmm. prominence and wealth, and 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 that too is uh, something that is that has uh, been widely disproven. By any number of, of economic historians, I mean, but even if if you just think about it, um, you know, the regions of the country uh, that were poorest uh, are the regions of the country that had slaves, both both in the U.S. and in other countries. The regions of Brazil that had slavery were the poorest regions, both during slavery and afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, Eastern Europe has been far poorer than Western Europe, even though Eastern Europe had slaves for much longer than Western Europe, and 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 of course more slaves were sent to North Africa and the Islamic world than were ever brought to the West, right. um, but the West got richer. Um, and, and, and even when those Islamic countries in the Middle East did get wealthy, um, it wasn't due to slavery. 
It was due to beneath, you know, this, the discovery of oil beneath the sand. So this whole idea that that that, that slavery produces wealth is has been discredited. Yet it is a central part of the 1619 narrative. So mm -hmm. so there are any number of ways to 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 attack this. But to me, the most central claim is the most problematic, and that is that. Um, America is somehow uniquely evil because of its of its slave past when slavery is an institution that existed a before there was an America in this country um, and elsewhere around the world almost every part of the world at some time had the institution what, what makes America unique is emancipation not slavery um, slavery was everywhere uh, emancipation is what has been what has been rare and, and, and so it, it is really that central claim. And when it comes to the 1619 project, what I also find so, so frustrating is that when you step back, America is becoming a more racially and ethnically diverse country by the day. The fastest growing groups are Asians, Hispanics. This 1619 project, which they want to teach to first and second and third graders, is teaching them to focus on our racial and ethnic differences. Right. Laser focus. As the country becomes more pluralistic, right. they want our kids to focus on skin color. I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's insanity. It is insanity. Right. And, it, and, it, and it stems from this whole belief that, you know, that diversity is our strength as a country. You know, Sol is, is, is commenting on this. He, he said... D diversity isn't our strength. Our strength has been our ability to overcome all the problems that come with diversity and focus on what unites us. That's our strength in this country. Right. right. <laughs> <Not> our diversity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how we're able to overcome our racial and ethnic differences. Right, right. Um, but so, so, so yes, this, this project I find extremely, extremely problematic uh, from beginning to end. There's much too little pushback. It's politically incorrect to push back. And too many of our intellectual elites are more focused on being politically correct than they are on being truthful. Wow, oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Shamika. Now, I was just gonna say, uh, she's a black woman. And at this time, black women are above criticism. So no one's gonna come and criticize her, like he said, for fear of, you know, or getting canceled right. because right now black women according to them are saving the world so who's gonna say anything against her really you know they know the mob right. will be after them and it's a legitimate fear you could lose your job right right mm -hmm. yeah. you you could lose your profession you could lose your livelihood it, yeah. it's it's not you know it's not irrational this fear it, that that's what's so dangerous about this cancel culture right. they can yes. really take you down yeah, that's why I hope more people speak up. I mean, it's slow. I, I, I see it happening, but not fast enough. Because, you know, for some people, I mean, I write a lot about human nature because I think it gets lost in these arguments. All these isms, all this, you know, you know, socialism, all this utopia will work if it wasn't for the pesky human nature, right? But eventually <laughs> people are going to be themselves. So um, I think that the problem, I think enough people, we have enough people regardless of the political ideology, who understands that this is a problem. Some people don't listen to it, they need to wake up, but those who hear about it know it's a problem. But it's like seeing something else. You see kids, you know, you, you, you're sitting somewhere and you see some people doing some bad things. You're like, oh, they shouldn't do that. It's not criminal. They shouldn't do that and you ignore it. You don't really get passionate until they come for you because that's just the human nature, right? You're like, well, mm -hmm. I don't agree with that, but you know, they're doing their own thing, but when they come for me, but by the time they come for everyone, it's gonna be too late. So mm -hmm. I think it's my job and the job of others to try to get people to understand how important this is. So going back to so, I think I borrowed a little bit from him, not intentionally. I mean, I've read his stuff and I love his work. We wanna, I wanna get to his approach, but on, you know, Shabika's laughing on, on the show, I always I have two questions that I also that I always ask. You know, I, I one two two approaches. One is that I give the left their argument. So a lot of people from the political sides want to debate about Democrat and Republican, of this politician, what's right or wrong, which works sometimes. But I say you're never really going to convince anyone that way. But I say I think the exchange of ideas is what's important. And if I think I'm right, I should be able to win that debate. Yeah. So I don't argue, I won't call your name. I just say, I'm gonna give you your argument. Let's say we do the thing you want to do. 
and let's take it to its logical end. And, and, and Thomas Sowell approached things a lot that way too. And my second one is, do they even mean what they're saying? You know, and, and one of my great examples is, climate change is, is bad, could be, but it's so dead, it's, it's an existential threat, and we're gonna die in two weeks. So my solution is to buy a house on the beach, right? So then you have to question the motives of someone like that, Obama. <clears throat> So Thomas Sowell and his approach had three questions that he would commonly say, uh, uh, bring up to, to any issue that came up to say, how do we flush this out? Can you talk about that and you know, ex expand on that with his approach to a lot of problems? Uh, sure, if, if, I, if I recall, um, the questions he likes to ask the left is- At, at what uh, cost? Yeah, yeah where, where is your evidence? Um, to, yeah. to support and, what you're saying. At, as opposed cost, to what, I think, right? Yeah, compared to what mm -hmm. and at what cost, yes. Right. Uh, and, and he says that, that that usually cuts to the chase on, on, on a lot of their arguments, and it's true. Uh, it does, and, it, it, and it's because he's operating out of this uh, view of human nature that you, just, that you just laid out there, that there are constraints, uh, there are limitations to human betterment. Um, mm -hmm. we, 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 there are people out there with utopian views. Everybody can have everything and there are no trade-offs in life. Soul, soul doesn't, doesn't, take, that, doesn't right. take that approach. So uh, no matter what he's talking about, whether it's economics, history, uh, racial controversies, um, migration, you name it, uh, he has this, this more constrained view of human nature. Mm -hmm. What is accomplishable? What can we actually do versus uh, what, what we would have done ideally if we were God and, and right. can snap our fingers and make it happen. Um, and, and, and so, yes, it, it sort of limits his, his approach to public policy. You made, a, you made a point earlier that I think is worth um, reiterating, and that has to do with um, Sowell's accessibility. His writing mm -hmm. is so accessible. Right. People who are not economics, uh, economists, people who are not intellectuals or scholars can, can read his books and understand what he's saying. He hasn't spent a lifetime simply writing books to his peers in the academy. Right. And uh, that's something that he's done very consciously. Um, it's something I think he picked up uh, at the University of Chicago from one of his mentors, Milton Friedman, who after leaving teaching also wrote popular books about economics and other issues. He felt uh, economic literacy was a very important thing and that intellectuals should not spend all their time simply talking to one another, that they should take the time to, to write things and explain themselves to the public in ways that the public can understand. And Sowell has really, really taken that to heart. Uh, most of his books are not written for other economists or other academics. They're written for um, uh, everyday people and in a way that, 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 that those people can understand. His best-selling book is a book called Basic Economics. And all it is is, is, is basically an economics textbook with no charts and graphs in it. Uh, and, and it's his best-selling book, uh, explaining these concepts and how they affect. He, you know, he says that he became an economist uh, to help explain the world around him. He wanted to understand the world around him, and, and economics helped him do that. And once he got some sense of that, he set about trying to explain it to others, which is why he wanted to go into teaching and did, in fact, go into teaching for a number of years. But he's always been a teacher at heart. When he retired his column, uh, back in 2016, uh, which he had written for many years, I, I wrote a piece about it and I said, some people just lost the best professor they ever had, even if they never went to college. Uh, because through that column and through these books, he's been uh, teaching, teaching for decades. I, I think that's the, I mean, for me, I mean, other people will have others. I think that's the most important thing. I just think it's so important. That's why every time I have an academic on, I bring it up. I mean, I, I love what they do. I'm one of those weird people that's not one, but I like to read those books, but that's an anomaly, right? Mm -hmm. And I just think that you spend so much energy and time being passionate about something. I've seen a problem you want to fix. You do all this research, mm -hmm. and then you write it in a way that people wouldn't get it. It's not plain enough. And then you sell it in a way that only other Princeton professors are going to mm -hmm. read it. So your this scholarship, this, this knowledge is, is locked away in a sense, right? So the people who need it most aren't getting it. And I think right. that that's a great thing that um, yeah. he did. I wish others would do it. Right. So um, one other thing I laugh about, uh, so his books are great, but they have really basic titles, right? Basic <laughs> economics, right? It's discrimination, uh, yeah. economics in, in this. It's just really basic. So 
was it intentional or did somebody come to them how did we get to uh black rednecks well you know <laughs> soul comes up with all, all of his titles i mean he, he even uh designs his own book covers I mean, that's why they're all it, it, it's black, very, white, and red. It, it's very hands-on his approach. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, saying anything, but it looks like he might have done his own. I, I'm, I'm sure the marketing team at the publishing uh, house had other ideas in terms of some of these titles, mm -hmm. and um, and Soul vetoed them and said we're gonna we're gonna stick with that. He's but that one was a little spicier though. And and he, um, I think he he might have regretted that title. <laughs> I remember interviewing him. Uh, uh, it wasn't for the book. It was chatting. I was chatting with him about about some other matter, and he mentioned um, that maybe that title was a little too provocative, mm -hmm. and might have cost him uh, book sales. It was not um, a widely reviewed book, mm -hmm. and I think the title of it might have scared someone away. Um, the, the the black rednecks white liberals book I'm talking about. Uh, right. But yeah, it was a little spicier than usual, and he probably uh, he might have some some minor regrets about that. Oh, okay. I, I just thought that was interesting because it was so, it was a breakaway from him. Maybe he was just upset that day. It's like, I'm just going to do this, but that was funny. Uh, another thing, you mentioned Ta-Nehisi Coates and those others, so I got to ask, I mean, there is not another Tom So, obviously, but is there anyone writing now or, or actively uh, pushing back or, or just asking for truth and speaking, cutting through uh, to what, what really matters now that, that, you know, you think approaches things in the same vein that he does? Um, well, there, there are certainly uh, black scholars out there who are challenging the orthodoxy in, in some ways. Um, I, I don't think they're the next Thomas Sowell, no, but right. um, there, there are people out there who are pushing back. You know some of them. Wilfred Riley, I would, I would put in that group. Uh, John McWhorter, I would put in that group. Glenn Lowry, I would put in that group. Uh, Bob Woodson has been doing it for decades. Um, uh, so the, the, there are there are people out there pushing back, and you know there are probably more today than there used to be when Sowell started out, mm -hmm. and there might be more today because of what Thomas Sowell did in paving the way for so many others. Um, uh, but but no, I don't I don't see anyone out there that has has uh, the volume or the range or right. the depth or the rigor of his thinking on so many different topics down through the decades. I mean, Sowell is a political philosopher. He's a social theorist. He's a historian. He's a sociologist. Oh, and he's an economist too. I mean, it, it's just right, the range. Right. One of the one of the uh, people I quoted in the book said he's um, one of the great intellectual trespassers of our day, um, <laughs> which isn't always appreciated. I mean, right. if you go back and and read some critiques of Sowell's books, um, you know, the, 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 he'll, he'll write a book on history. Some historian will, 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 will um, review it and say, that's not how we think about history as real historians. Here. Right. So people are very protective of their turf. They're protective of their turf intellectually. But Sol is uh, shown a, a very firm grasp of a number of disciplines. And, and, and again, he combines that, that rigorous thinking with the ability to write in plain English. And I think that is the real, um, uh, the real advantage, his real value added to, uh, to a lot of these debates. Yeah. Um, what do you think um, things would go? Um, obviously, he's still with us, but he's not writing anymore. You know, I talked to you mentioned Bob Woodson, Shelby Steele. I, I, when I talked to them, I asked them, I said, there's other people. Obviously, people will come up and people will fill a void. But, you know, as well as I think I, 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 I am definitely a clear thinker and Will Riley and others who have a really logical and honest approach, even if we're as good as Thomas Sowell, it's still different, and, and, and Shelby and the others, it's still different because we don't have, all, have an addition to that, the firsthand experiences, you know, that you can come with, because some people need that. Some people will say, like, you, you, you talk about how he was approached by historians saying, well, you're not one of us. So there's a value in being able to say, and I grew up doing Jim Crow, or I was there in, you know, part of the civil rights movement, even though I, when they went the wrong direction, I went a different way, like Bob Woodson and Tom. What do we do when we're in our 40s and 30s and 20s as we go up and we read these books and we absorb this knowledge, but we don't have that, when we lose that direct knowledge base, what is going to happen to the, you know, the debate going forward? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, and, and, you, and you're right, and Tom has written about this himself, his, his ability to be able to bring his life experience to his scholarship. 
and and because his life experience is so different from so many others in the academy who took a very different route because they came from a very different place uh, he thinks that's added a lot to what he's been able to say that personal experience that he has this is a man who was born in 1930 in North Carolina in the in the during the Great Depression in the Jim Crow South who was orphaned um, as, as a boy never knew his father who died before he was born his mother died a couple years later giving birth to a younger a sibling of his so Tom never knew his parents he's taken in by a great aunt moves the family north first to Charlotte and then up to Harlem where he's raised um, has a very tumultuous home life drops out of school um, at the age of 16 leaves home at the age of 17 never graduated from high school um, uh, you know, works as a messenger, uh, other odd jobs uh, to, to try and make a living. Um, joins the Marines, gets drafted into the Marines. Um, goes to, to college at night school at, at, at Howard in D.C. on the GI Bill. Then moves on to Harvard. Um, uh, he, he's, he's talked about, you know, he didn't, he didn't get an undergraduate degree until he was 28 years old. He didn't write his first book until he was 40. Wow. And he's written 36. <laughs> right, wait, 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 he's, five or six since he was 80? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so you're talking about someone who has had a remarkable, a remarkable upbringing. He's been able to draw from that. Um, started out on the left, was a self-identified Marxist mm -hmm. through his 20s. Um, uh, and, and talks about what, what attracted him to Marxism and then why he decided to part ways with it. All from life, life experiences that, that yeah. he had. The one thing, but you know, I'm thinking about this now, the one thing that we can do of a younger generation um, who, you know, if you are 40 or 50 years old in this country, uh, you've been alive for some time, you've seen some changes too. And I think that, that what the, <laughs> what the Ta-Nehisi Coates's and Ibram Kendi's and Nicole Hannah Jones's often get away with is pretending that their life was like Thomas Sowell's. <laughs> That's a good we point. know they are lying. This, right. this, this, right. this country is not what it used to be in 1930 and 40 and 50. It wasn't even like that when they were little. What do you have right. segregated lunch counters and right. you know, we don't hire blacks in the way. They didn't live through that. This isn't, we're not still living in 1950. So much of their scholarship is pretending. Right. It's, it's faking, it's play acting. Right. And, 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 and we, we, we can call them on it because we've been we've alive been the right. same year as they were alive. And, and I think that's how we can do sort of what Sol has done with his scholarship. Shamika, talk we, to me we about can, that. We can, talk, keep talk, it, we, can, we can keep it real. Right. <laughs> Shamika, talk about that my truth stuff that they do, the whole, you know, how my lived experience is what matters, and I can write 12 books about it. But another black person goes, well, excuse me, we went to school together. Can I talk about my lived experience? <laughs> shut up. Right. Unless it's the same as mine, you shut up. You're not real black, you know, because, you know, all real black people are. What does she say? All blacks, we know all blacks aren't politically black or whatever silliness she was talking about. Yeah, it burns me up, you know, just like the, the 20 year olds that are out with BLM and they're, you know, breaking windows and smashing cars and things. And I'm like, you all had everything at your fingertips. You know, most of you have $1,200 phones, but you feel like you're so <laughs> oppressed. And that just really irritates me because thankfully my grandmother is still alive. She's 87 years old. And I just think I would be doing my kids a disservice if I try and raise them in, and have them thinking they're living the life that my grandmother lived. Like, thankfully, I lived a much better life than she did and my kids will live a much better life than I did I would in no way have my kids out here protesting and you know screaming and calling white people devils and you know oppressors you lived a really good life like for God's sake my daughter called me today is like oh I think I'm being followed you know like they call me for little bitty things like you have a really good life you got lunch brought to you, you had Wendy's during the day you know you didn't have to drink uh, white milk every day like I did you know and so it's like life is good and I hate the people that pretend that life is just has just been so terrible if you're our age you had a pretty good like 
I had a really good childhood. Mm. Even not being rich, you mm. know, you could play outside. Mm. You know, things were, life was good. Mm. So I hate this mm. idea that you have to just act like, you know, America's so racist, life is terrible, mm. and you're 50 years old. Get please. And, well, and let's be honest. Reason, one reason they do it, and, and I don't like to psychoanalyze people. Um, uh, I, I don't like it when people try and psychoanalyze me or, or Clarence Thomas or Thomas will put us on the couch and, you know, so I don't like to do that to others. But I do think that incentives matter. And, and, and one reason of the folks we just were talking about like to play this, this victim card is because it, it pays. It, the racial grievance industry in this country is a very lucrative one. You can make a lot of money um, telling white people what is wrong with them. I mean, you, you just can. There's, there's a market for it. There's a huge market for it. You will win MacArthur Genius Awards. You will win uh, Nobel Prizes. You, 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 the, 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 uh, the, the civil rights movement has been turned into an industry, if not a racket in this right. country. And there is a lot of money to, make, to be made which is why I don't think um, these black progressive groups and, and individuals are going away anytime soon. You, you can make a very, very good living doing what they're doing, regardless of whether you are telling people the truth or doing uh, the black underclass any favors. You, but, can, you can personally benefit quite a bit. But yeah, but remember earlier I said that um, one of my questions is always, do they really mean what they're saying? And this goes to one of those. So the, have you ever noticed this? They're saying that they're writing books and articles, and not Nicole Hannah Jones, but they're writing books and articles and saying, you know, things are so bad, the country's so racist, it's endemic, they hate blacks, it's so hard for blacks, blacks are so oppressed, blacks are so oppressed, it's so bad for blacks. Then they talk about, whenever they, they, take, they punch out and they're not making their money, they talk about how fabulous their life is, right? They're going to the balls, they're going to these things, they're flying all over the world, they're going to these, they, they, they're hobnobbing with celebrities. It makes you wonder, which one is it? Because when I see your, the way you live, it seems pretty awesome. But the way you talk is how bad it is. So, you know, it's another sign of this. Yeah, not only are you right that they, make, they can make a living from it, a, a, a healthy living, but they don't really, they don't really mean it, it's not, and it's not helping anyone. So it, it kind of lends the question, why don't people notice this? I mean, we see them, you know, yeah. hobnobbing with celebrities and politicians and flying all over the world. But it's like, that's the same person that said that their life is so difficult. Or the lives of black people are so difficult. Yes, right. Yeah, I, 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 I drive a Mercedes and live in a big house in a fancy neighborhood, but I'm still fighting the man right. for, for these other black... I got lucky somehow. And right, right, right. It yeah. fell in my right. lap. But yeah, we, we, you have people talking this way, even, as, even in the wake of a twice-elected black president in this country. They want to pretend the country is as racist as, it, as it's ever been. A, a, a majority white country... Uh, with a, a population that's about 13, 12% black, two times elects a black man president. It's still 1950. No, just that, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything. You've had black mayors running major cities in this country back in, from the 70s, you know, Detroit, Chicago's, Philadelphia's, Cleveland, Los Angeles, New York. In the, the South, South now, Cheese. they had yeah. mayors in the South Yeah, now. Atlanta. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah. You, you, you've had black fire chiefs and police chiefs and, and senators and, and congressmen and, and uh, they want to pretend that, that, that nothing, nothing, no nothing has really changed. No progress has been made. And, and, and again, if, if you're a civil rights organization, um, if you're an activist, this is how you raise money by pretending yeah. nothing's changed. If you're a politician, this is how you scare people to the polls by pretending that, that your voting rights are in jeopardy in this country. It was this, this voting rights discussion, if I could just get this off my chest, drives me crazy. So uh, uh, we, we, we're having this huge debate over whether the black franchise is in jeopardy in, in America. Right. The, the, the black voters are being oppressed. In, in, in 2008 and 2012, the black voter turnout rate was higher than the white voter turnout rate for the first time in history. It had been going up since the mid-1990s under Bill Clinton, steadily rising. By 2008, it surpassed the white rate. And in 2012, surpassed it again. It dipped in 2016, 
but only back to the pre-Obama level. Right. And then in 2018, we had the highest minority voter turnout for every group, for every minority group in the history of this country in the midterm elections. But that's and because they didn't have the IDs. And in 2020, Hispanic and Asian voter turnout reached record highs. For blacks, it was the third highest after 2008 and 2012. So this idea, if, 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 if Republicans and conservatives are trying to suppress the black vote, they're doing a very poor job of it. <laughs> they, 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 they just are. Black voter turnout rates have been rising. When blacks are sufficiently motivated to vote, they go vote. And as I mentioned earlier, voter, voter ID laws are supported by something like 8 out of 10 Americans. In court, including a majority of blacks, majority of Hispanics, majority of Democrats, majority of Republicans, a majority of liberals, a majority of conservatives. The, the only people opposed to these laws are these elites, and they are speaking for themselves. They are not speaking for the majority of Americans. Um, it, it, it's just, it, it is quite, black, black voter registration in the South is higher than it is in other regions of the country. In, in 2018, the year that Stacey Abrams started her you know, anti-voter suppression organization, black voter registration in Georgia was higher than white voter registration in Georgia. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it's just a, an example of how completely divorced the, the prevailing narrative can be from the actual facts. Right, yeah. Unfortunately, and they control the narrative, so that's yes. what we get. Yes. All right, I'm going to talk about immigration really quick, though, because sure. you know you wrote a book, uh, "Let Them In," which is probably shocking for people. Oh my God, this conservative actually is pro-immigration, which is silly because they have these, like you say, they put you on the couch and they have these ideas about what you believe. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to know, um, you know, you know, piggybacking from that, you know, it's eight years ago or something, and looking at not what's going on oh now, if you think that the with the policies that they've been pushing through it's changed uh some of the ways we should approach immigration or you, do you just think they're just doing a poor job well well my book was an argument for a more free market approach mm-hmm. to immigration right in other words um letting the the law of supply and demand determine how many people we uh, give access to our labor markets here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And no, I haven't changed my mind about that. I think the alternative, what we have, which is politicians trying to, you know, pick and choose, central planning, (laughs) essentially, when it comes over, we'll take so many from this country this year, so many from that country this year. I I think that is a a, a, a far worse way to handle handle immigration. So so my, my central approach there was that um, I think we need a more market-based immigration system, and and I know I haven't I haven't changed my mind about that mm-hmm. at all. One one big difference between I think that book was two thousand seven two thousand eight, so it was a little a little while ago. Oh, even longer than that. Okay. Yeah, is um, uh, today we sort of conflate the two, but back then traditionally, the immigration debate has been quite separate and apart from the refugee debate. Uh, I don't know if I even mentioned the word refugee in my book uh, back in 2007 or 2008. I might have briefly uh, in a throwaway line or something. But um, this sort of refugee issue that we have is not the same uh, uh, traditionally as, 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 as immigration. The people are motivated by the same things. People behave very differently when they are fleeing uh, uh, danger in their country versus whether when they're when they're willingly migrating leaving of their on their own to go someplace right. seeking a better life and so um uh, a refugee crisis is is a, is a little bit different um from from the the immigration debate that i'm discussing there in the book so i, I would make that's that's one thing that has changed since i since i wrote the book and uh, last, I want to talk about uh, your upcoming book, but Will joined us, so see if uh, Will has anything he'd want to uh, add or say. Well, I'm, uh, apologies, we're dealing with some financial issues here at KSU, just, uh, just went to a meeting. But um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I just popped into the conversation. I'm not really sure what, what you guys were talking about at, at the, uh, the time I arrived. Was it the, uh, 
Maverick book or yeah. Let Them In? Is and the, when you the popped in, I think I was asking him about uh, his book, his Let Them In book. But before, you know, we were talking about you can you can you can say whatever you want to say positive about Tom Sowell if you want. <laughs> no, I mean, I think we all we all know I like Tom Sowell. I think the the entire the entire panel likes the OG. Um, yeah, no, though, actually, I guess if we're just keeping with the flow of the conversation with Let Them In. This is, I suppose, one of the few things I would uh, kind of disagree with Jason on in terms of policy as a political scientist. I mean, we've seen, so th there's a lot of argument about, I think we can all set aside, this is an all minority group, all black group. You know, some of these conversations are immigrants, good people, do they want to work hard and so on. And just take that as a given. I mean, a, a lot of that stuff over on the hard right isn't really all that relevant. But I mean, the, the main focus of this conversation in political science is that wages have been stable in the USA since 1973. And I remember one of the first things that I ever said that was considered heterodox. I was talking at one of our conferences, Midwest Politics or something, and people were coming up with all these left-wing reasons for this, like, well, the outsourcing of jobs and so on. And I said, well, wouldn't two obvious reasons for this be that our workforce has basically doubled because of mass immigration and feminism? And everyone just kind of moved away a half step and like, view, viewed this as an extraordinarily bizarre idea. But I think there's a pretty strong correlation, like wages, last I ran an analysis, are 3.8% below their, where they would be if it weren't for mass legal immigration. This is, this is mentioned uh, actually in Jason's most recent uh, book chapter, and that, that doesn't account for illegal immigration. So I guess maybe you've already said this, Jason, but what is, what is the argument for kind of unchecked immigration, or what checks would you put on immigration? I haven't read Let Them In for a while. Well supply and demand i mean we, we don't we don't put a check on how many burger kings are allowed to open or how many buick dealerships are allowed to open in the country either supply and demand uh determines that and and i think that um the market would do a much better job of 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 allocating uh labor resources as as, as well what, what will is really discussing here though is, is a long standing argument in economics but it was settled some <laughs> some centuries ago really and these are what are called limits theories this is what thomas malthus was writing about that that um the the lump of labor theory um that um uh, that we have to worry about uh, uh, uh too many people seeking too few jobs um too many people uh uh, uh consuming too many resources uh too few resources and so forth so we'll have mass mass uh, starvation in the country if we don't limit the number of, of children that are born and, 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 and so forth. Uh, this is an old, old debate that uh, has been going on for a long time. But what, one of the more recent um, examples you can use to push back at it is, and we'll mention this briefly, is um, women entering the labor force uh, beginning in the 1970s. Um, so forget about immigration. If we're just talking about if too many people enter the labor force, we're going to be in trouble because there's as if there are some fixed number of jobs out there. Uh, and, and, a, and a woman taking one job means one fewer job for a man, uh, which is the argument being made with immigration. An immigrant takes one job, it's one fewer job for, for uh, an American native. Well, if you look at what happened after this huge influx of women into the labor force, uh, not only did uh, unemployment uh, uh, go down for both women and men, uh, but wages rose for both groups. Um, and, and, and again, it was another refutation of these of these limits theories that have been out there for some time. It's it's it's, it's about looking at the labor market as a fixed pie, um, or or something that is not a flix, a, a, a fixed pie. Um, and and I guess I take the I take the latter. Uh, approach um, um, says law to, 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 to take to bring it back to soul um, uh, supply creates its own demand and and that is what I think um, has happened with uh, with respect to immigration in America and around the world uh, or with respect to um, the, the the what's going on in the labor force internally uh, irregardless of the levels of immigration well, well, I'm sure Will will have a response to that, but I want to throw, you know, one more layer on there. My, my issue is because I don't have a problem with uh, legal, obviously, immigration. And, you know, we can talk about do we put a limit on it or not. So I, I, I'm not as bothered by uh, your letting the market decide. But that's all focused, seems to be focused around 
the labor force. But there's a cultural price to the immigration thing that I think needs to be addressed too. So yes. if the market can decide how many we get, whatever employees I need, if I can't find them here, I can bring them in. If it's 50,000 or if it's a million, but we also need to maintain America as America. And part of that is who you're bringing from a, a values perspective. It's not saying that you have to be a certain race or from a certain country, of course, but you know, there's certain things about the ideals of America that if you are, you know, antagonistic to them, we probably don't want you here. So <laughs> again, again, this is, the, the immigration is one of those debates that's older than the country, Charles. And right. so, you know, Benjamin Franklin was complaining about too many Germans coming to Pennsylvania in the 1750s. Right. Said they're gonna Germanize us before we can Anglify them. Right. So again, you're, you're, you're making a modern day <laughs> argument. <laughs> the, 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 this idea that immigrants are gonna change America more than we uh, 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 change them is, has been around for, for a long, long time. L listen, for two, two quick points. Um, I don't think anyone likes illegal immigration. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think we even need to discuss that. We should do everything we can to reduce illegal immigration to this country. We want people to, to do things the right way. Uh, and, and we're a sovereign nation. We should decide right. who comes here, how many people come here, and on what terms. Yep. That goes without saying. And, and we need to enforce the immigration laws that are on the books or change them, um, one or the other. But the lawlessness that we see going on on the border today is inexcusable, and this administration seeming indifference to it is outrageous. Uh, but when it comes to what type of immigration system we would like to see in America going forward, it could definitely use some updating. The system we have in place was for a more agrarian-based society. Um, it's hundreds of years old, mm -hmm. and we don't have that kind of economy anymore. And we have an immigration system in place to handle a 20th century and 19th century economy. Uh, so it certainly could use could use some updates. Um, um, uh, I, I, there, there's 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 no question about that. But but yes, there are trade offs. There are trade offs when you're bringing in um, uh, particularly poor immigrants. Uh, the impact they're going to have on education systems, the uh, impact they're going to have on healthcare services and so forth. That all needs to be to be taken into account. And the question is whether uh, once you do take that into account, we are better off or worse off. And I guess I'd argue that at the end of the day, I think we are, are better off with finding ways uh, to accommodate people who are coming here uh, to seek a better life. Uh, they will make themselves better off, and historically they have made the country they go to better off as well. And so um, uh, that's something I'd like to see in whatever system we, we ultimately wind up with. Yeah, I want to say something real quick, and I'll go to Shemekin Will. The last thing, but I agree with you that um, I don't, I, I want to make a point that I don't think that them coming here is going to change it. Like people say, like, like you hear a lot of Republicans say, the Democrats are letting these people in because they want to make, you know, Democrat voters. And that you have to be, you know, it's not that simple, right? You have to understand that there's a socialist half to these people who tend to be coming, true, right? Who, who would align with Democrats. But culturally and, and, you know, religiously and in other ways, they tend to be less for some of the things. Like, so you get a mix. So you don't know where these people are going to move five or 10 years down the road because they may all, you know, be poor, as you say, and some want handouts, but some may not. But even those who do may not necessarily be for the intersectionality and all the race baiting and all the other things that they're getting. So it's not a given that they're going to get Democrat uh, voters like they think they are, is one thing that I want to point out. But uh, Shamika Will, last thing on immigration? Um, if Shamika wants to go, that's cool. I, I, I do have a quick comment. Okay. I mean, a lot of this, so, I mean, you guys once did uh, half of an episode teasing me about being amoral. Um, I mean, a lot of my points are just uh, really data. I think you, the, Jason's right, these, these questions have gone on for hundreds of years. I mean, I would argue Malthus was actually right looking at the technology of his time, but I think we can look at them empirically today. I mean, in the case of immigrant assimilation, one of the things that's worth noting about the, the German immigrants to the USA is that we have the Pennsylvania Deutsch today. The thing that made most German immigrants, as I understand, any of you guys could correct this, but really assimilate into the U.S. mainstream was World War One and then World War II, and it became a lot less comfortable to be a German-speaking German in the American business community. So, I mean, there, there's a question today, and I don't think in either political science or economics we've measured this very well yet, all that well, 
But I mean, there's definitely a question of in the modern quote unquote CRT era, are immigrants assimilating? There's also the idea of absimilation, where people who want to come in, who initially are very glad to be rescued, frankly, from places like Haiti, have children that join this sort of, you know, 50% POC rebel block right. in the country. And I've seen that happen quite a lot growing up in an Eastern More European than the parents, country. right? Yeah, they're far more woke than their parents, and more so than any, with the exception of some rich white kids, Americans, I see. Um, so, I mean, when you're looking at immigrant voting, I everyone says this, that there's a great deal of potential for immigrants, people from these Catholic, stable, trad countries to vote for either party and to become great Americans. What we actually see, though, pretty consistently is that more than 60% of Latinos and 90% of blacks, including black immigrants, vote for the Dems. So at very least, someone's going to have to figure something out here, whether that's a merit process or whether that's the Republicans reaching out more aggressively. I don't, with all due respect to all the positions, I don't think we've, we've seen that yet. So all of this to me, I guess without babbling for a long period of time, my comment is I favor merit immigration. I'd actually agree we need to update the system a bit. But in terms of the wages point, for example, the reason it matters that wages were stable, I, I certainly wouldn't agree that women ruined the economy or anything like that, is that wages had previously been growing at a rate of something like 12% per decade in real dollars. So when you put people into the economy and you give them jobs, it's, it's true that they then consume and they create jobs. But if you're working a job for $25,000 a year, the most that you can create with your consumption and your credit is another job paying roughly $25,000 per year. So it, it's definitely true that during the era of immigration, the era of feminism, the GDP has increased. The question there is kind of what sort of country we want to be. Um, how have the wage rates for native workers, which I think is the group that you're looking at, if we're talking from a black perspective or for me in Kentucky, a heartland perspective, how have those performed? And that is, in all honesty, a bit different. So I, I do think we need to revamp the system. I think we all agree on that. The question is what we want. Closing sentence, I don't think Americans agree on that. And I think that's the big problem in the immigration debate. What are we looking for? Well, I guess you can't really solve a problem unless you know what the solution is. That is true. I guess we're going to have to leave it there. We're going long. But uh, Jason, any last words you want to say about uh, uh, the great Tom Sowell? Thank you for your interest in his, uh, in his work and in the biography and film. I appreciate you uh, having me on. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it was great, and uh, you want to. We got a minute if you want to talk about. You do have an upcoming book. Tell us what that upcoming book is about. Uh, well, it's 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 about uh, the shrinking income inequality that took place under um, uh, Donald Trump, and uh, the, the relative absence of attention it received in the in the mainstream media. And I try and and uh, describe why I think it was significant and deserved more attention than it, than it actually received. So that's the, the thrust of the book. It's titled Black Boom. And uh, I don't have a, a, a pub date, a fixed pub date yet, but I'm guessing later this year or early 22, it will be out. All right, that's great. Well, we'll be looking forward to that. He is Jason Riley, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and economist for the Wall Street Journal. Jason, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I got a country to save. Patriot J, I'm saving the day. Patriot J, I'm saving the day from you commies who let know you can't fuck with me. I got a country to save. God bless the U.S. of A. Land of the free and a home of the brave. God get all of the praise. I got a country to save because I'm Patriot J and I'm saving the day.